What's good with everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Get The Who's Podcast. I'm pretty sure this is episode 22, and I'm joining here today by a basketball watcher at its highest level. Shout out to my man. He does a lot of coverage for the Sacramento Kings. He also has a YouTube channel as well that he pops up. He's consistent for pretty much every Kings game during the regular season, and he's a good guy. Welcome, Deuce, to the podcast. How you feeling, man? Gifted, man. So good to uh, finally wrap with you a little bit. And by the way, talk about obsessed with basketball. You are watching everything all the time. You're creating content left and right. It is August 13th. It's a so-called dead period. And it doesn't feel that way because you're literally all over it. Yeah, man. I just love basketball so, so much. And right. I always look at every, like every off season, right? There's many creators that pause and just come back. But I say, okay, so much happened in regular season. Let's unpack everything for all 30 teams and see how every team is, is impacted. Because once the season starts up again, convos are going to be had about, okay, last season, last season. And I think in the Western Conference specifically, there's a lot to unpack with a lot of these teams, especially your Sacramento Kings, who after a very long time, they have finally clinched. They made it to the playoffs. It was a very, very big season. But I, we got to first start off with the roadmap that got you to that point, which in my opinion was the Sabonis trade from last season. Let me know your thoughts as a Kings fan seeing that happen. I think at first it was utterly shock around Sacramento. Like I was just shocked because, you know, there was so much noise. Like, hey, the Kings are going to be active during that time. You heard a lot about De'Aaron Fox. I just didn't, I, I never thought it was going to be Halliburton. So once that move was made, it was like, wow, this is a huge shift one Tyrese showed tremendous promise and he's a hell of a player like he's a really good player and at that time De'Aaron Fox was didn't feel like he was that same guy it was like yeah. he's gonna take a step the team is losing he doesn't seem totally engaged at this point so I think the initial reaction from people was like I don't know what they just did they're betting that Fox is gonna be that guy and they're giving up Halliburton for Sabonis well, it ended up being something that was perfect for Sacramento. Like Tyrese is a stud and I think Indiana has a great young core. They're headed in an awesome direction with that talent. He does so many good things out on the floor. You got to give up something to get something. And I think the Kings believe that De'Aaron Fox had another level to get to and that getting a player like Sabonis could help Fox get to that next level. And Sabonis is one of the better bigs in the league. So. It's one of those trades that at this point you look at and go, I think it worked out for both sides. Yeah, I I would have to be 100% with you on that. I think the very interesting part here to me is when Sacramento made the trade, things between Fox and Halliburton looked kind of shaky. Halliburton was playing his best basketball and was really like e emerging. And yeah. Fox seemed to like not be like the same player that we knew he could be capable of being. But as soon as the trade happened, Fox started to play his best basketball. The way they closed out their season, sure, the wins weren't quite where you would want it to be, but you saw the potential, you saw the two-man game. And again, like the efficiency of Fox in terms of improving himself as a pull-up guy, as a guy that got to the basket way more, and the playmaking that Sabonis provided off of these offensive rebounds and just throwing dots to guys. Like you saw the roadmap. And as as someone that's not like a fan of the team, just seeing them play, I'm like, that team has like sneaky potential to be very, very scary. What I would highlight is a couple seasons before it maybe 2018, 2019, whatever, that team with uh, healed with the previous head coach who got fired, sadly, but like the Dave pace Yeager. that they, yes, Dave Yeager. He was so like explosive as a coach. I just like that team a whole lot. So then after you add Sabonis and, and then you guys hire my coach, Mike Brown, and then he goes over there, a coach that has spent multiple times, you know, in years in the Warriors for their playoff runs. I just felt that the accountability piece and, and like the culture in terms of, of winning and the X's and O's of how Golden State's offense ran. I felt like with Sabonis, you can literally do those similar types of things. So coming into the season, I'm like, this team is not going to be as bad as a lot of people thought they would be. Like a lot of people said, 
they're going to be like 12 seed, uh, 11 seed. I thought this team was going to be right in that race to make the playoffs. But for you, what were your thoughts? I thought going into the season, I thought the offense was going to be really good. I thought they were going to take a big jump. I didn't envision the type of jump that they actually took, which was number one in offensive rating. You have all these new players. You got a new coach. Usually it takes some time to build some chemistry, but that wasn't an issue. As far as my expectations, I was like, uh, I think 40 to 44 wins. You know, can they get in and maybe get the sixth spot, be a playing team and get in that way? I definitely did envision a scenario where they would be up there as a number three seed and winning 48 games. Like, I, I think they surpassed everybody's expectations. I thought Vegas was criminally low on them last year. I it think the over under was like 33. And I'm like, guys, I understand it's Sacramento, but like there's definitely pieces here, right? You add Herder, they added Monk last offseason with Fox, a bonus Mike Brown. Tell me they can't win more than 33 games. So I was higher on them than most, but I also was not this high. I, I did not think they were going to win 48 games. Yeah, it was just an outstanding season that they had and i have to highlight this too like the way the Kings started their season they were oh, <laughs> yeah i i love bringing this up yeah. because i watched all four of those games and a lot of people just didn't so they yep. were like oh they're all in four it's the same team but i watched this like no they're not the same team like they they barely lost those games and they were competitive in every single one of those losses and i just had like a big amount of respect for sack because the vibe just felt different. Like the the atmosphere, the chemistry, and the way the team was rallying around Mike Brown, responding to his voice early on. Like you could see that, okay, this team is not the same. Like even before basketball was played, how he had these guys running suicides up and down, like throughout the gym, you just felt the infectious energy Mike Brown was putting to the team. And then, you know, obviously you guys wind up having the best offense in the NBA. Sabonis is playing at a super dominant level, but the leap De'Aaron Fox took. I said for me this year, like I never give up on players until we're like in like the fifth or sixth year. So for Fox, I'm like this, this has to be the year for me that Fox takes that step. And my goodness, did he? I mean, all NBA caliber guy had a phenomenal, phenomenal season. What were your expectations for De'Aaron coming into this upcoming season? So I, I, I've always been the guy that was the Fox truther because I saw enough flashes. I'm like, he just needs some help. Get the yeah. guy some help. Let's see what it looks like. And uh, you, you saw the flat. You mentioned that 18, 19 season where it was a super young Kings team and Dave Yeager was pretty much like, hey, let's just run. Just push the pace like crazy. And you saw the flashes. Then you saw Fox, you know, in the coming years, the scoring up ticked, but the wins weren't there and people, you know, we do this in the league sometimes where the, the best guy, even if they show potential, if you're not winning, you're not going to get the love. I mean, we saw that with Devin Booker in Phoenix, right? Like, yes, what was book got so disrespected over the years because his team wasn't winning. Now, was that all on him? I think some, some of it, you, you definitely take some responsibility, but there was chaos in the organization. There was missed lottery picks, you know, coaching turmoil, uh, flawed rosters. Similar with De'Aaron Fox. It wasn't a perfect situation in Sacramento over the years. They didn't have a ton around him. And then, let's be honest, it, it when the Kings have certain weaknesses and they decide, okay, we're going to draft Tyrese Halliburton. We're going to draft Davion Mitchell. I think if you're De'Aaron Fox mentally, that's like, wait, I, I thought I was a point guard. You just drafted right. two, two point guards. So I think there's a lot of layers there. And I think people slept on his ability. Um, I, I, he's also gotten better, but he's been an elite mid-range player. That is a, you know, when he first got in the league, it was, oh, this guy's the fastest guy in the league. Like it was, he was a blur. Now it's a change of pace, right? He could speed you up, slow you down. He could finish at the rim, mid-range, the three-point shot. You, you hope to get better. Like I'd love for him to be like thirty-five percent consistently, which isn't great. But, you know, that's I, I'll take that. But he does so many good things out there, so explosive, and I. I was, I think as the years went on, maybe I was a little more concerned, like, okay, well, maybe I'm just wrong on this. But once they got Sabonis, once they got shooting, shooting around these guys with Herder, Monk, Keegan Murray, you saw the offense open up and you saw how explosive De'Aaron Fox could be with that, with that spacing. Oh, yes. Like, like, uh, I have not been down 
on Fox primarily because I've been watching Fox since he was in college. And again, like Lonzo Ball, he was my favorite prospect that year. And seeing what Fox did to him in the Sweet 16 tourney, like the change of pace that Fox brought, like, you know, he, He's automatically in like the top 90% in terms of speed and just raw athleticism. But throughout the years, I think he's slowly started to develop a more of an outside shot. The mid range shot is a shot he's become a lot more comfortable with. But the fact that each year he's taking steps to improve um, the way that he's getting to the basket, his angles, the way that he's passing out of, you know, double teams and triple teams, but the way that he's using his pace to help other players, like his chemistry with Monk, who, by mm -hmm. the way, same college and all that stuff, right? But th those two guys in terms of how they just turned up as these guys who, yeah, maybe we can't shoot the three at a consistent high level, sure, but you're still going to guard us because of how quick we can get to the rim, how good our pull-up can be sometimes, how if we're in rhythm, that three can really bury you. Like that Kings team brought a lot of the same pace that they had from years past, but also with the semblance of a sophisticated half-court offense. Because there's yeah. a huge difference between you going 100 miles an hour and not knowing how to slow down things and get a good set. But the way Fox is a bonus play in that pick and roll, even without each other, that half court offense was a real thing this year. Oh, yeah. And then the dribble handoffs with Sabonis and Herter and Sabonis yes. and Murray, which, you know, to the Warriors credit, they did a great job defending that come playoff time. But the offense was explosive. And it, when you have that type of shooting, when you have high, you have a ton of players on the Kings with high basketball IQ. And there, there has to be a level of, you, you got to check your ego a little bit. And sometimes with this offense, right? Because, you know, De'Aaron De and Sabonis are going to do their things, but you know what? Herder one night could be the guy that's getting a ton of shots. It could be Monk the other night. It could be Davion Mitchell, Keegan. That could be tough for some players, but when you have the buy-in from all the players, when Mike Brown has set that kind of culture and foundation with that coaching staff of the accountability you mentioned, and the ball moves, you know you're going to get yours sometimes, but you still have to check your ego a bit. And I think the I Kings, that this year's Kings team did a great job of that. It was a, a, a selfless team that was moving the ball, making the extra pass. And when the ball's got energy, that's that's a fun way to play. Like it's it's such a fun style to play in, and it's obviously more fun when you're executing it at a high level and winning games. And that's why for me, as soon as you guys got Mike Brown, I'm like, this is really big for the Kings because again, Mike Brown was literally in our system in terms of like passing and like having the ball not stick, bringing that style to sack with more athleticism and more guys who can knock down shots to me is why you were able to be so productive. But the biggest thing for me that impressed me the most is the resiliency from the Kings. And I say that because the second half of the season, it was funny because people were like, okay, the Kings are good. It's the first half of the season. Memphis, they're gonna probably, you know, beat them. LA, they just traded all these players. They're gonna yeah. probably come up. A lot of people had the Kings like, you know, Kind of being like, let's say the Jazz, right? Like a team that had like this hot start, but then it levels down and they don't make the playoffs. And instead, the Kings said, no, we're just good. <laughs> let's continue to have the best offense in the league and let's just continue to be a much better team. And like Sabonis got injured during the season and said, you know what? I'm still going to play. We have to make the playoffs. I want like yeah. he he played through that. I have a huge amount of respect for that and the resiliency to say, ignore all these outside expectations. We know who we are. We trust ourselves. Let's go out there and perform. And to do that and finally break the long playoff drought, I have a ton of respect for that. To me, that was the best story in the NBA last season, Deuce. I agree. And you go back to the Sabonis injury. That happened just after Christmas in December. Sabonis so could have been out, had surgery, and missed six to eight weeks. And that would have been devastating for the Kings season. He wanted to play through it. He missed the next game. And the only reason he said he missed it is because the splint, the special, the special splint he was wearing wasn't ready. So he missed the right. first game in Denver, played the next one, and he played after that. And that level of toughness, just fighting through stuff, he's one of the toughest players in the league. And I know the narrative about him after the playoffs was like, oh, Looney got the best of him. Look, Sabonis can't just do it on his own either. The guy was playing 
with an injured hand the whole year. He brought something. The, the Kings would not have been in that position without Sabonis. I mean, he he means so much. He's like the soul of the team. Like the, the way he moves the ball, how he works. He's obsessed with basketball and he's tough. I think that bleeds toward the rest of the team. Like everyone else buys into that and they want to be a part of that. Yeah. I love your point too because again, I saw a multiple Kings game where on the sideline you would see Sabonis yelling at Keegan Murray like Keegan, shoot that! Like you're that good! Like like have have confidence in yourself and like I just love the vibe like how the entire team and the fan base rallied around each other, light the beam, light the beam, and it wasn't just like some mean thing. This was a thing that the entire team was like dedicated to as like a thing. And everyone like continued to come together. And in terms of on the court, Sabonis was a very unselfish player. He had multiple times where he would take the ball, pass, make those right reads. But encouraging your teammates to shoot and wanting guys to be better, a part of what makes a really good team are those habits, sure. But maintaining those habits over 82 games and building out that continuity. For the Kings to do that at a high level and not drop off again, this is a team that a lot of people had relatively low expectations for and then, yeah. you know, sincerely blew out the water those expectations. Yeah, and I, I'm still amazed at how fast that chemistry built because th they at times this year look like a team that had been together for a couple of years. And I, I think that's just such an underrated aspect with this Kings team is they were able to build a legit on-court chemistry with their offense in year one. You bring back most of the guys in the year two. What does that look like this year? You know, with some tweaks to the offense. What does that look like in Keegan Murray's second year? Sabonis knowing all these guys even better. I think the offense is going to be even more explosive. Yeah, it's funny because you have a lot of people who are trying to make the safe takes like, okay, the Kings were good this year, but, you know, X or Y team wasn't healthy. So now they're not going to be as good. I feel like you really have to look at where the West is going. And ultimately, if you are a young team that has spacing, that is shaping out your continuity, all that stuff matters. And the Kings, largely as a team, your guys are healthy. You know, a lot of guys played high, high games in terms of the 65s, almost 80 games. Like you had a lot of players playing significant basketball and that gives you a lot of time to figure those things out because when night to night you know who's going to be on the floor you understand how to better maximize and play with each other and to me that's one of the most underrated parts about the entire run sabonis nearly played literally like i think he was at maybe 74 games played on the season like you barely see that out of guys especially that physical considering how he was hurt he, he played 79 games last year so I mean, look, when you look at the West, I think it, to me, it's similar to last year. There's still question marks all over the place. I mean, who do you trust in the West right now? And I think the, the, the team that immediately comes to mind, the defending champions, the Denver Nuggets. Right. After that, you have questions. There are legit questions about the Memphis Grizzlies. There, there are even questions about the Golden State Warriors, as talented as they are. How's it all going to fit together? Like, right. are they a legit championship contender? I think after Denver, you go up and down the West, you go question mark, question mark, question mark. And I think the Kings, based on having that continuity, the explosiveness with their offense, I, I envision that they're going to be right in that top three again this year. I feel like year two for the Kings. And like, obviously, we'll get into that more after we yeah. talk about the playoff run but i feel like year two for the kings is so important because now that you've had a full year under your belt a lot of people have to understand once you play together for a full year and you largely bring back the same rosters which i have to really give you guys credit because for the off season they basically maintain their same roster so those pieces for the most part are going to be coming back and you have a year two of guys like a keegan right year three i'm pretty sure and guys like a davion like these guys get more time to jail and sometimes if you already have the best offense now you have more time to make that an even more structured system and potentially even get better defensively as well like i think keegan projects to be a guy that can really be a impactful guy on both sides of, of the basketball floor but it takes time these things don't just you know pop up in like 
one year or two years. So I think the Kings are firmly in that hunt. I will say that. A wild stat from last year, because everyone talks about the Kings defense. I believe they finished the year 24th in defensive rating. At home, their defensive rating was 29th. On the road, they were 8th. And, yes. you know, you saw some flashes, obviously, especially on the road. But even in the playoffs where it gets a little more physical, you're going up against the defending champs at the time, the Golden State Warriors, and you saw flashes of a better defensive team. In fact, it was their offense that was letting them down against Golden State. Yeah. You do wonder if year two, can the Kings make a jump into, can they be top 16 in defense? And I know that's not great, but you, you again, we're talking about a team that's been near the bottom in defense for the better part of like 15 years. Yep. They don't have any great individual defenders besides the Davion Mitchell, but I think they have smart enough players and high at basketball IQ. And if you can play some good team defense, you can be competitive. I think we also have to remember the team that won the championship last year, the Denver Nuggets, they finished the regular season 15th in defensive rating. I think in today's game, you need to have an explosive offense. You need to have shooting and you obviously have to get some stops, but I don't think you need to necessarily be a top five defensive team anymore to, to win a championship. I think this is a very interesting conversation because every time when I told people the Kings are a real team this year, guys, they kept saying they don't play no defense, they don't play no defense. And I understand that, but there were moments where like, I'm pretty sure in the fourth quarter, right? And again, this is off of the top of my head, but I think the Kings had some of the best situational defense in the league, like in terms of like fourth quarters, really executing down the stretch in the proper way and my thing with the kings is it's not just like they run they run they run it's the fact that they can kill you in the half court and they can stagger fox and sabonis during the game who can both impact the offense at a super high level and more importantly there was just no quit on this team like the best example of this is when they went to double overtime with the with the la clippers one of the best games of the year by the way and you literally see sabonis foul out of the game <laughs> monkey checks and he, he, he danny has has 40 points on like 38 minutes or whatever and they're just fighting to win just just never out never out never out never quitting even though they were down multiple times that resiliency yep. to me shows you what a team is made of to fight 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 especially against good teams like the clippers and you know, you, if you didn't watch that game, you go 176, 175 double overtime. There was no defense being played. No, there was, it was elite, just tough shot making. It elite. was elite offense. And those both those teams were competing. They were fine so hard out there. And that's the one thing with Sacramento. I I think if you go back and watch sometimes last year with their defense, I don't think there are many examples you could go, that was a lack of effort. You know, I, I think Part of it is just you, if one player out there makes a mistake, it can really mess up everything. And so I, I don't ever think it's a lack of effort. I think if the communication's better this year, they should be able to show some level of improvement. Like I said, like to, to have like the, the success, success they did defensively on the road and even in the playoffs at times, I feel like there's something there. There's another level that they can take. And that, that to me starts with someone like De'Aaron Fox too, who I thought took a step but has to do it consistently. And that's a lot to ask. It is. I mean, there is so much pressure on De'Aaron Fox to push the pace offensively, to do all the things that we just talked about. Hey, attacking, getting to the free throw line, hitting the mid range, right? Pushing the pace. Oh, and by the way, we want you to go check the other team's best player right now. And so, and oh, oh by the way, they're trying to defend him because he's one of the premier guards in the league. So th there's a lot of pressure on him to take that step, but that's what comes with it. When you're a foundational piece of a team, you have to take that step to do it each and every single night. Yeah, it's it's not easy at all to play defense in this league, especially with like how the rules are favoring the offensive side of the basketball. And also like, it's just a much more athletic game up and down, up and down. And I just think that having a good enough defense in the important situations matters in terms of you being able to understand at the very least where you are because you can have weaker defenders sure but if you are able to put these guys in a system with 
maybe some neutral guys and you just understand where to be and you're showing the effort that goes a long way to having yes. a sustainable defense because yes. if you can get a bucket on the other end it just comes down to strapping up in the biggest moments and i feel like for that kings team they had a lot of times where they would get themselves within close games i saw many games where like it's like a 20 point hole or deficit and down the stretch fox three Sabonis and one just back and forth and they would fight themselves back in the games routinely during the regular season so this has never been a team that I was really you know not sure of because even in those first four games th those first four games to me were the blueprint for who the Kings were in terms of like fighting back okay we lost let's fight harder and, and they just kept finding smaller ways to you know improve improve and improve and, and that you know, that was still a fragile time because I'm with you. I saw the same thing as you. I saw a team that was competing. But again, if you're in that locker room, if you're De'Aaron Fox, who, you know, was in year six and you've seen a lot of losing, even if you were amped up before the season, like every most every team is, you're all amped up. It's like the first day of school. You're, you're all fired up thinking, I'm going to get good grades this year. But in basketball, everyone's happy during training camp unless it's just chaotic. There's always some level of hope going into it. But for De'Aaron, who saw and experienced a ton of losing, to be out of the gates 0-4, I'm sure in the back of his head, he's thinking, oh man, is this going to be yeah. the same stuff again in Sacramento? And that that's a credit to Mike Brown and his staff for keeping those guys engaged early on. And that that's a challenge for a new coach too, right? You've been preaching it. We're doing it this way. Trust the process, trust our offense, trust what we're doing out there. We're going to win games. And then you come out of the gate 0-4. That's that's a very fragile time for a new coach and, and, and really a, a new team that's constructed. So it was a credit to them to keep competing and trusting that, hey, we can build this and, and get out of this hole. I think that's a great point because it's so easy to say, trust this system. We're working on X, Y, or Z. But ultimately, you got to see results that justify yep the sacrifices you're making to blend in and accommodate that type of style of play and again for the kings to just fully embrace that despite going 0-4 and turn their complete entire like season around again it just speaks to like the camaraderie from those guys so for me in 2024 there's a lot of things i'm looking forward to but before we get to that i want to focus on the playoff run right so this team clinches I think it's been how long since they made the playoffs? Maybe like it was 16 years. years plus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 2006 was before this past year. 2006 was their last playoff series uh, against the San Antonio Spurs, and then yeah, they had not made it since 2006. <laughs> Insane. I was so happy for that fan base. Yeah. Oh my god, I was at that last playoff game. I was like a senior in high school. Game six in Sacramento between the uh, Kings and Spurs it ended up being Rick Adelman's final game as head coach. And it was never the same for years. Yeah. I, <laughs> I Dude, just I mean, could think, not think believe about it. All the lottery pick. Think about all the lottery picks the Kings had. Oh, all the man. misses over the years. All the signs of hope thinking you're going to turn it around and it falling flat. The Kings, and that's the that's one thing with the Sabonis trade that can't get lost is like, it, it was a tough trade to make. It really was, especially because people in Sacramento are always going to be keeping an eye on Tyrese Halliburton and what always. he's doing, right? Because the guy's an all-star player and he's a young player. He could shoot. He could pass. He's a great guy. He's someone that you would love to play with. But if the Kings hold on to Tyrese Halliburton, they don't, they definitely don't get Sabonis. They're not getting Sabonis no. for Fox. Like that was not going to happen. So where would the Kings be at? If they kind of kept that together i don't know if they'd be in a better spot i don't think they'd be in a better spot right now so they make that trade and they give their fans something that they haven't experienced in 16 years and that's a winning product yeah and i kind of don't understand some fans at times because it's like now that we've made the playoffs is championship a bust and i don't uh. understand this because it's like so after 16 years of not making the playoffs, we finally play at a high level. We have the best offense in the league, like all all time offense by the numbers. We make it to the playoffs. We play a competitive seven, not six, seven game series versus the team that just won the title. And now you're saying trade everybody. We need to win. We're in <laughs> win now mode. How about we adjust? We build up continuity. We make some bigger moves maybe in the next two to three years, but we just see where we are. Like, I don't think that's such a, 
a big bad thing to do because continuity matters like golden state and denver were both teams based on continuity in their cores for most of most of years it takes a long time to learn how to win in the nba yeah a very long time and that's where i give monty mcnair the king's gm a ton of credit he he doesn't go out there to try to win the headlines and i i think some people and i get it as a fan you see your team get some level of success you want more of it it's so fun to win and you want a championship so you go go get this guy go trade this guy i, I think monty i'm not acting like the guy's perfect but i think he's made some really good moves and i think he's really patient if you look at the king's cap situation looks pretty good it looks good they don't have any crazy contracts they got their guys locked up long term they don't have a whole bunch of draft picks in the future that yep. uh, are tied up in anything like they they have their draft picks except next year's goes to atlanta but besides that they've got all of their picks um their core guys are locked up they've got some nice assets i think when the right move is there he'll go out and strike but i, I don't think you just need to make a move to make a move that's not always the right call you know what i mean exactly. so to your point yeah bringing back this group and the other thing too we keep saying bringing back this group do not sleep on the fact that the kings brought sasha bazenkoff over and bring up his name in a minute deuce yeah he, i'm telling you man nice. i'm telling you this he was a euroleague mvp last year bare minimum he is a role player that can come off your bench has a quick release can shoot it from three he could finish inside he moves without the ball and he could pass that's an upgrade over what they were bringing off the bench last year. So a team that was really good last year, just upgraded bare minimum. And then, you know, people talk about his defense. Oh, what's that going to be like at the NBA? Yeah, there's probably going to be some issues at times, but he's again, we go back to, can you be in the right spots? Are you bringing the effort? He does those things. He could be a part of a good team defense, potentially. I think it's a big time pickup. And that was a move that Monty McNair made that was totally flew under the radar in the 22, 2022 NBA draft where they traded a second round pick for the rights to him. Right. And then a year later, they end up bringing this guy over on a team friendly deal. So I, I, I'm just, if we talk about bringing it back, I'm like, well, they did bring it back, but they added another key piece to this group. I think that's a big name. I have to bring him up because Initially, I didn't know who he was, so I said, you know what, <laughs> I'm gonna do my Googles, and I watch like, you know, some film, and, and it's like, that release is so quick. Like, it's a lightning quick release. He's like 6'9", like like a, a much taller type of guy, and like, sure, sure, there are some, you know, questions about his athleticism, but his IQ in terms of knowing where to be on the floor, and the type of passes he was throwing, like, I can see him fitting in to what Sacramento does automatically day one. And he's not like a younger type of player that needs to have like four to five years to find out. He can come in, I think, and produce from yeah. day one and then I improve agree. as you go with that. So that's a great thing because a lot of teams, I feel like, make like these big splash moves. Like, let's let's go acquire this player because he's a name and he's done X, Y, or Z compared to, well, how does this benefit our roster? What is our cap flexibility going to look like if we get this guy? Are we going to be handicapped with the roster? Like... These are things that I'm seeing the Kings front office look at and care about. And for me, as a fan of the Warriors, it's just funny seeing it because it's like I've seen the Kings go from being like this weird team that like was was cool sometimes, but didn't really make the moves to give themselves to success to a team that is doing a complete 180 on that and just making great move after great move. So you got to give yeah. the Kings a whole lot of credit for that. I mean, this was an organization before Monty McNair that would go for more like the headline moves, like the name recognition, giving big money deals to Trevor Ariza, oh, giving yeah. Corey Joseph three years, $39 million, right, to come in when you had De'Aaron Fox on the roster, signing Dwayne Dedman to a big deal. I mean, those, are, those are big misses, right? Like what, what could you have done differently with that money? And to Monty McNair's credit in Sacramento, it, it, hey, he's had a few years here. They're, it hasn't all been pretty like they've experienced some losing, but I feel like they finally put themselves in a position where they have a core group that's kind of all around that same age, you know, not counting Keegan right now, but 20, 25, 27 years old. They're around the same age. I mean, Kevin Herter's also still young. Kevin Herter's like 24 yeah, years old. He's also young still. Yeah. People, you know, he's not a finished product either. So 
you, you start looking up and down this roster, you're seeing the flexibility that they have, the talent, the youth on their side, and you could see that they're building this out to be sustainable. Uh, for the next several years. And I think that's another thing, you know, so many people are like, oh, Sacramento just trying to get into the playoffs. No, you you can't just try to get in the playoffs once. Like if Sacramento made the playoffs and ended the drought last year, and then they don't make the playoffs another It'd be 10 years. People are be heated. No, you don't, you don't make moves just to limp in the playoffs. You make moves and they don't all have to be at once to build a sustainable product on the floor and 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 trust what you're putting together and and long term the fans will be happy i think that was well said because people have this weird thing to where let's go all in to make the playoffs and now that we've done that okay now let's break down all of that and just add a whole new team and hope that that team goes further that's not how the nba works there's talent there's cap space there's development all three of these things are significant in terms of you trying to compete and for a team that is a younger team who still has many pieces who are trying to blossom and develop into great players into the nba your role is to basically maximize that window make it as long as possible but do it with the right approach of going through our guys giving confidence in these guys year after year getting a competent coaching staff to maximize these guys on and off of the floor getting these players put in great positions by sabonis and by fox who have only played together basically like one and a half seasons like let's get some even, breathing room I, I mean, I I have to go back and double check it, but Sabonis after the trade when he came over played 15 games, so I think they might have played 14, 15 games together. That's nothing. Yeah, it's not even that crazy. It's not even that crazy. Like like that. That's why that that matters so much. And I just feel like where Sack is, there's so many things you can do. Like just because they haven't done like some some crazy blockbuster thing now, guess what? The NBA changes so quickly. Yeah. Kemba Walker went from an all NBA player to nearly out the league in four years. It took four years for that to happen. So, so the timelines are accelerated dramatically during the NBA. So these people that are just wanting big splash moves to happen, that's cool for like a neutral fan to be like, oh, wow, I can't believe like, sure, that's fine. But in terms of actually trying to win it and be a successful and sustainable product, it takes time. It, it really does. Absolutely. And I, so I, I, I dig the approach, right? And now, you know, you go into next season with expectations, which changes things, right? It's not just expectations from fans and media. It's internal expectations. You made the first round last year. You played the Warriors. Now, like, how do you how do you build from that is the question? Yes. And I think that is the perfect segue too. so me as a Warriors fan, I'm going to yeah. give you my perspective, right? So so I was one of the only people on Twitter or, 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 you know, who believed in the Kings. Like I kept saying for the entire year, guys, the Kings are going to be better than the Blazers. I remember when that was a conversation because they started out their season four and oh, you guys were 0 and four. Game was dropping 40, 40, 40 right? Like, like things look insane. And I'm like, guys, I'm trying to tell you that the Kings as a, as a team are going to figure this out and they're going to be a playoff contending team. I really do think that. So then, come to my amazement, you guys make the playoffs, and now my team has to play the Kings. I felt a way, I, like, regardless, I felt like I was going to lose in some way, because while I love my team, the Warriors, I just loved everything that the Kings stood for. Yeah. And also, you guys have Mike Brown, who has been on our team for so long. Like, he really understands the ins and outs of what the Warriors like to do and in that playoff series it was very competitive because ultimately no one could stay in front of fox and monk in that series it was very difficult the only other guy we really had was mainly gp2 you had andrew wiggins not like not play 25 games of, of basketball towards the end so a lot of it was like figuring things out on, on the fly and just praying in steph curry and thankfully steph curry was steph curry so that was good but what the kings were doing just in terms of pushing the pace over and over and over they matched the style of play that the warriors did which made it a super competitive series i do think the x factor in the series was probably not steph or Draymond, but kevon looney i mean like yeah, his so his rebounding was so big at times because he gave us multiple second chance opportunities that kept us in the game or gave us opportunities to really extend those types of possessions coming into that series though for you 
what were your expectations and what did you think of the matchup? Well, I'll never forget when it was official that those two teams were going to match up in the playoffs. And, you know, obviously there's a level of excitement just because, hey, the Kings are back in the playoffs. But I, I was definitely concerned. Like, I was, I was excited for the opportunity for Sacramento. Like, hey, for this new, new team together to get this type of test in the first playoff series in 16 years, their first time being together, a great opportunity to learn. But I'll never forget this. And someone let me know. I forgot I even said this on our podcast until after the series when someone tagged me in it and reminded me. I said before the series, what scares me about the Warriors is that if this game, if it goes to a game seven, Steph Curry could drop 50 on you. And then Did sure, you really say that? Because <laughs> I'm just like, I have so much respect for the Golden State Warriors. Like I, I know there's so many people you know, around the league that gets tired of them and they, they hated when KD went there and they don't like Draymond. I respect them because of how they built the team. You know, they, they built it through the draft. They drafted Steph and Clay and Draymond, right? That's how they change their organization by, by the draft, developing those guys, staying patient with Steph Curry, giving him a four year, $44 million deal when his ankle was bad and people going, why would you do that? And it ended up being a deal that propelled them going forward, right? Allowed them to have the flexibility to make the moves and then adding an Andre Godala, right? And how that kind of shifted things for them and eventually adding KD. I have a tremendous amount of respect for their style of play. I think Steph Curry is one of the greatest players of all time, selfless, elite, like I respect them so, so, so much. And so I was beyond, I, I knew it was a different Warriors team and I understood Wiggins being gone. I was like, maybe the Kings have a chance, but I I just didn't have the expectations that in year one, the Kings could beat the Warriors. Now, when the Kings went up 2-0, I'm going, well, I mean, I'm not saying the Warriors are dead, but dude, like this yeah. is this is big time stuff. They're fine through it. I felt like the series totally shifted to when, when Fox got hurt. And again, something else that doesn't really get talked about in that series is when he hurt his hand and he wasn't totally the same after that. I thought the Warriors and the Kings played so hard. They played physical. Both teams, I don't think ever reached their offensive potential necessarily in this that. series, yeah. right? Like, it was a weird, odd, like defensive battle about rebounding where the Kings who were a really good defensive rebounding team during the regular season, Looney just destroyed them. And Looney is such an underappreciated guy for what he's been through with all the injuries and how he battles. I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. And I think one thing that doesn't, you know, they talk about the whole Sabonis Looney thing. Look, Sabonis needs some help from his teammates too and with the with the rebounding. But the the one aspect, Sabonis, who led the league in rebounding last year, that maybe gets overlooked with him is Sabonis is not a long guy. You know, he, he's got like a six eleven re- wingspan. Looney's seven four has a seven four wingspan. He's long and he's going after the rebounds. Sabonis had so much attention on him. They were beating the hell out of him. It was very physical. Yeah. It was so physical. <laughs> and like his hands still an issue. So um I, I just realized I'm rambling on and on about the series. But uh yeah, I think going into it, to go back to what you're asking initially. I, I didn't think Sacramento would win. Obviously, I started to shift my thinking after the first two games. I was just so happy that the, this Kings team got this opportunity, this type of test early on, because I think you learn more from this than maybe like, I don't know if a matchup's different where they win a playoff series against someone else. It's possible in the first round, but they will learn so much and they gain so much from going up against a team that has a championship pedigree. I think the perfect parallel, ironically, is the run you saw Golden State go on before they made the run in 2015. Like going up against those veteran teams in the playoffs and showing people, oh, wow, the Warriors might be something like they show like real chance. Like, sure, you might not have won, but the way that Fox and Monk said in this series, we're not backing down. We're not afraid. We're going to play hard. And like every night they made us have to earn that win earn it like it showed that like sacramento was so far removed from whatever people thought of them coming into the season because they went from a laughing stock in many people's minds to we got to respect this team this is a really good team and like 
you just saw it consistently throughout their playoff run. I mean, there were so many moments where it was just competitive up and down until it was like three minutes left and it came down to execution. Like going down 2-0, coming back at home with no Draymond in that game, it's like, oh my goodness, if they lose this yeah. game, the series is pretty much over. And like seeing Steph show up in those moments was very great to see for me, but it's it just like, I can't speak to the level of respect that I have for the Kings because this is a team that a lot of people just shoot away, count it out. And I love seeing teams that could go from not really on the map to we're building something, we're, we're moving towards because this NBA like continues to grow with more teams and, and talent. Some teams are going to go down for other teams to rise up to the top. And I think Sacramento is one of those teams that, you know, is young and getting their first taste of the playoffs They're going seven, not like a, a cute six, not a gentleman's five, seven contested mm -hmm. games with Golden State. You got to give that a whole lot of respect. And winning that game six on the road when big, it was big that was yeah. big time stuff. I remember after that game six, I, I I left that arena going, I think the Kings are gonna win this series. That's that's how I felt. But you know, um, it, it's interesting reflecting back because Harrison Barnes was not a factor in the series. Kevin Herter, Kevin Herter wasn't a factor in the series. Keegan Murray for the first few games was not a factor. And Sabonis had so much pressure. I mean, I think those guys not being able to knock down shots and Golden State's ability to defend that dribble handoff and, and compete really shifted things. It made life challenging. And then all of a sudden there's pressure on Sabonis to take a mid-range shot, which clearly the hand was an issue, but it was also in his head too, where all of a sudden they're not defending you. And I think we've seen this in the playoffs before where a guy just doesn't get defended yeah and thinking about not getting defended and it's in your head a little bit and sabonis is a good enough player to take that shot and i think sacramento going into this season that's got to be more of a staple of what they do too it's like we gotta get sabonis some looks so when that happens come playoff time he's gonna take that shot and knock it down because he can knock it down you know i i'm not acting like he's some elite shooter from the perimeter but he's more than capable of knocking down a mid-range shot i hope he is to the point where he's comfortable taking some more threes this year and knocking him down. He shot a good percentage last year. Didn't take a ton of them. Shot a good percentage. I think it was around 38% for Sabonis, but unlimited attempts. But I, I think Golden State showed them what their weaknesses are. And sometimes you, you, that's where your weaknesses get exposed come playoff time. When you're, you're in game playing and during the regular season, I think when you watch games, the see, there's just so many games. You're not game planning so intensely in the regular season. Sometimes you're just getting by. You know, you played four games and six nights. It's you've been traveling a ton. You're going out there. You're just trying to win. Like there's not like hey, you're locked in. This is Steve Kerr, a championship coach with championship players around him, locking into what you guys do best for seven games. And how are you going to respond to that? And I think so. The Sabonis factor was a huge one. I think Herter looked gassed to me and he went from being a guy in Atlanta that to be honest, they're not, they're kind of standing watching Trey a lot, you know, as talented as Trey Young is, there's not a lot of movement. Right. Um, and he comes to an offense this year where there's a ton of movement. He's moving a lot, coming off triple handoffs. So to come this series, he's got to deal with increased physicality and them trying to get trying to stop that dribble handoff playing physical with him and oh by the way he's got to go chase clay thompson he has Chase clay yep. that's tough and so what that tells kevin herter i hope this offseason is i need to be in elite shape something that doesn't get talked enough about with steph curry is his conditioning his ability to be non-stop like a soccer player out there that guy just constantly moves sprints and he does it not just in November and February. He's doing it in June. All year long. All so year long, yeah. How do, you, how, how do you do that? You know, if you're Kevin Herter, how do you get to it in elite shape? So come playoff time, you're ready for the increased physicality. You're ready to chase around a Clay Thompson. Those are all things that you'll be watching for the Kings. Like, all right, how'd they grow from this? For Keegan Murray, I thought he got better as this, this series went on. Keegan Murray got an experience that most rookies don't get. 
not only did he start and play 30 minutes a night throughout a, a season where the team won 48 games, he knocked down 200 plus threes on 40% from three. Actually, Kevin Herter did the same thing. But for Keegan to do that and to get the experience to be starting playoff games, his rookie year and competing against the Warriors, huge. Those experiences, those reps are going to be great, really impactful for him in the future. Yeah, it's 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 a lot from that series that I really focus on the King. So my thing that I've been screaming and like it's crazy that you like the first thing you said Sabonis in that 16 foot shot like when the handoffs were being yielded a lot of it was based on like pressuring him to have to shoot and he wasn't sure every time should I take it or not I do feel like that weight on him but I think in terms of confidence I think he's able to knock down that shot if he had a more consistent shot like that it would have broke our defense more because the way that we had to get out to Fox and Monk who could just make you pay and get to the free throw line quickly we had to basically give up the coverage on the handoffs to make that work so for Sabonis to improve himself in that regard that would make their team a lot more threatening and I love your point because Keegan Murray is a rookie like he's coming in shooting 40 percent on that volume going up against a team that just won the title last year so i didn't expect him to be great because you know obviously it's his first time in the playoffs but having that as your rookie year and having that sample size to like you know <laughs> stare at and, and now you come in as a sophomore understanding the difference between the regular season and the playoffs most young players don't get that opportunity and i do feel like with the flashes he showed in the summer league like Ooh. he's gonna be good I think yeah. he's going to be a really good player. I think more shots are going to come his way as well. But the main thing I love is I actually love that he did not play well to start. I love it because he had to dig himself out of that hole, dig himself out of those trenches. And then towards the end of that series, he was a much more productive player. That game six he had against us, like I remember how productive he was looking, right? So, so like now you come in saying, okay, I was timid to start. But I picked it up at the end. We started to win more and it was a close seven game series. Let me now add to that confidence by being in summer league, having 40 point games or whatever. So now I come into the season a much more confident player. The wonders that can do for him can absolutely shift the dynamics with this Kings team. Yeah. And last year, his re his responsibility was catch and shoot. You know, he got a lot of catch and shoot. He, he, he established he can do that. And, you know, in those two California Classic games, when he's putting the ball on the floor, he's creating some shots, he's hitting some step backs, you start wondering, okay, if we start seeing that type of growth for him, from him next year or the year after that, what does that do for the Kings? You know, a, another guy at 6'9", who has a quick release, who shoots it well, who's not scared, if he can start adding more to his game, the Kings are going to be really tough over the next few years. So yeah, I'm with you. That experience was huge. And going back to what you're saying about game six too, where how he played, but what you mentioned with Sabonis in the shooting, Sabonis got in foul trouble that game. They end up playing a lot of Trey Lyles in that game six. Trey Lyles is a threat from the good. other side. Knocked down really the good. three and you saw the Kings have success. So if, if Sabonis can just get to a point where he is comfortable with that, that could be really beneficial for Sacramento. I think that's a great point because every game I was writing down like what the X's and O's were. And I'm telling you, every time it would be the rebounds, the second chance opportunities, Man. and the three point shooting. Pretty much every game. If you go through like every game in that series, the team that won for the most part dominated those three categories in direct comparison to the other team. Game seven, Kings didn't sh shoot that well from three. Uh, go to state struggled, sure, but the rebounding and the three yeah, point sh shooting from Steph. Third the third yeah. quarter rebounding changed everything. You know that everything. that was a at halftime. Game yeah. seven, I'm like, all right, well this is going down to the wire. And that third quarter was just the, the, the rebounds sucked the life out of the Kings in that building, and it was done. And then I Steph, think Looney had like eight rebounds in that third quarter, like like. It was ridiculous yeah. what he was doing. And the thing that makes rebounding so important in the playoffs is 
possessions are harder to come by offensively. So when you're securing offensive rebounds, you're giving a team a chance to stay in the game, add on to a lead or get back into the game. And time after time, Looney would get these rebounds where even if he didn't get it, he would impact it so much. We would find a way to get it. And it's a Klay Thomas or reload three. It's a Steph Curry, take the ball, reset, high pick and roll, great possession, right? It like it, it, yeah. it just kills you. It just sucks the life out of you, right? It's hard. Yeah. You're slumping your shoulders, you're frustrated, you're tired. It's the end of a series. You're trying to fight through it. It, it's mentally taxing too. And that's one thing I, I'm interested in the Kings next year too, is like, all right, what type of level, we talked about the games played. Um, I, I think there was a great benefit to them playing a lot and, and playing a ton of minutes. I, I get all that. But does the strategy shift a little bit? Are you going, hey, HB, we played you 30 minutes a night. You know, we're gonna play you 26. Uh, Herder, we're knock your men's down. So bonus, maybe we can knock them down a little bit, but you want to stay in elite condition. I think that's the other thing. The Golden State Warriors, they know what it takes to play late into the summer. The Kings right. don't. That was the first time for a lot of those guys to get that experience. And I, I felt like you saw that at times. You're like, oh, these guys are, you, you, you're playing a longer season. It's much more physical. It's much more exhausting. It's much more emotional. I think you have to be prepared for that. And I, I'm I'm curious to see what that looks like. You know, if the if the Kings are able to have another good year, what's that look like in the playoffs? Do they look like a different team that, you know, is able to knock down shots? Because that's the other thing. It's a team that was so good at knocking down shots. So good. And yeah. At times they just look they just look tired out. Their shooters look tired. I think a big part of that too, and like this is a team thing here, right? But the mental tax of having to guard Steph Curry, like the conditioning of yeah. how he's getting to different spots, how like you lose him for a second, he's over here three. Or or he he attracts so much attention, there's cutting layups, there's oh shoot, I wasn't paying attention off ball because I saw Steph here and I was so worried about it. Boom, like that tax every night of having to guard that. And then play up and down with that team, knock down your shots on games where you're not getting rebounds. So you're not getting those exact possessions you would like. And it's more physical. It's just yeah. a very taxing thing for, for a, a young team that, you know, frankly, just hasn't been in those positions that much. That's why to me, like for their first matchup to be that team of all teams, I don't think there's that many other teams in the West who are going to challenge them in that perspective because... Your defense, the POA can be questionable on guards who have Steph Curry's skill set, sure. But if you look at every other team in the West, not many other teams have a guard that is a similar archetype to what Steph Curry does, which means the type of defense and the challenge it would be would be different. I feel yeah, like. and that, that's why I, I know a lot of Fit Kings fans are bummed that the matchup was going to be the Warriors in the first round because of you know, the, the respect for them, but you know, I, I still maintain, I'm glad that, that this was the first matchup for them. I really am. I, I, I think you, they, they can learn so much from this experience and, and be a better team because of it, you know, and maybe you don't get that type, that same type of level and feel if you're taking on a different team in the first round, like what the Warriors brought to them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Great playoff run and also great 2023 season for the Kings. What are your expectations for 2024? We've yeah. already broken down like some, some areas we think players can improve on, but where do you expect the Kings to be? How far do you think they can go? Lay it on me, Deuce. I looked at the West and I said this at the start. I, I trust one team and that's the Denver Nuggets. I don't trust, you know, if Phoenix... If that all meshes together, are they going to be explosive? Are they going to be tough during the regular season? They can be, but I, I go, okay, is KD staying healthy? Is Beal staying healthy? What's that group around them? We, we've we talked a lot about continuity, right? You got almost a brand new team there with the Phoenix Suns. Okay, we'll see. On paper, you can try to sell it to me, but over the years, I've been sold 
teams on paper. The Nets were going to win all these championships. The Clippers were going to win all these championships. It doesn't always happen that way. Continuity, one. And then health, obviously, is a big factor. We could talk about health with every team. I get that. But we're talking about teams, when you look up at the West, that they haven't proven to stay healthy. Every year, we talk about Kawhi and Paul George. Every year. Those guys are tremendously talented players, and I want them to be healthy. They haven't proven to stay healthy. I don't trust them. Uh, the Golden State Warriors, like I, I, healthy respect for them as we've talked about. You know, I, I don't know. I gotta see it. You know, I, I don't. I, I, I like Chris Paul a lot. How is this all gonna mesh together? Right. You know, yeah. I, I think there's a point of. I think right now the vibes seem really dog. good. I listen to Clay with Paul George, and it seems like Clay's really focused on getting to that next level again. And. Steph is going to be Steph. He's working his ass off per usual. Um, the whole Dr Draymond Jordan Poole thing's gone now. So maybe the vibes are better. Wiggins back in the fold. Okay. They're going to be a good team. I don't know. Or do we trust them? Um, the LA Lakers. I don't know, man. LeBron's aging. I know they made the conference finals last year. I think I like some of the moves they made. I, I don't know. I, again, can you do you trust AD's health? My whole point on this is... I don't trust a lot of these teams in the West, and I think the Kings are going to be one of the better teams in the West again. How far can they go? I, I think that you could make a case they could get to the conference finals. I think they get to the second round this year, uh, depending on the matchup. I don't look at them as a championship team yet. It, it goes to what we talked about, too. I think you got to go through it. You got to go through the disappointment and the pain. As a longtime Kings fan, I remember the early 2000s Kings going back to 98, 99, that first year when they had C Webb and J Will. They got knocked out of the playoffs in the first round, first few years. Then they got to the second mm -hmm. round. It took them years. It took, then it took the trade to get Mike Bibby. And then all of a sudden, they're in the conference finals, right? It, you have to go through some of that pain, I believe, to take those steps. The Warriors, same thing. We talk about, you know, the disappointment that they suffered early in those years they had to get over those humps i think the kings have to go through that a little bit but i think with their offense with that second year of that core being together i think darren fox is still underrated i think keegan murray is going to take a step this year i think sash is a big pickup i think their team is deeper one of the deepest teams in the league i think even again a guy like chris duarte i know he wasn't great last year but he's back with Sabonis, had a good rookie year. That's a good guy to take a flyer on. I think they're deep. They've got high basketball IQ. They've got shooting. They got offense. I think they're going to be a fun team to watch. And I think they're going to be just as good as they were last year, if not better. Well, for me, my official take on the Kings, I think the Kings are going to be better. I agree with you. Uh, I look at the Kings as a team that A, has a continuity coming into next season. They were the best offense this year with Sabonis sustaining an injury for the second half of their season. I think Fox can continue to improve as a basketball player. He had many moments last year where he was an effective player both with Sabonis and without him at a high, high level. And How he was he? He was the How much was he? Bro, bro, literally, <laughs> I'm sitting here watching the games and like the shot making, like the game winner versus I think the Magic and yeah, he was just great. He was just great. I think he can add on more to that. I do trust it in Keegan taking another step in his sophomore season as well. But really, it's just the style of basketball that they play. Like that offense is not just some one year thing. That offense to me can be a sustainable thing because it's predicated on ball movement, cutting high IQ players doing high IQ things. Sabonis is passing the a uh, ball penetration from Monk and Fox. I think those things are here to stay for this Kings team, which makes me think they're still going to be a really, really good team. I would argue that they're going to have home court advantage once again in the West. I'm not quite sure where I've settled. Part of me feels like the Kings could honestly be the one seed. I think Denver is the team that towards the end of the 2023 season, they kind of folded their season in. They made the playoffs and they won. Part of me feels like They'll be super dominant to start, but they'll take their foot off the gas again at the end, which could leave the one seed being a spot that's open for grabs. I think the Suns, as you said, are, are a really good team, but there's a lot of question marks in terms of continuity and health. And, then, and that's like a very top-heavy team in terms of talent. So 
not really sure but i do expect the kings for me at least to at least be a a top four seed i think they're for sure going to make the playoffs in terms of how far they go in the playoffs that is a hard question because to me it's extremely matchup dependent i agree extremely. Yeah. like like i can't even say on paper how many of these teams are going to make the playoffs and then go further like it's super based on who the kings match up with but i think their offensive style there's not that many teams that can guard them at a high high level in the west so yeah those it's, are my weird. On it. it's just so weird thinking that this could be the case just again a year ago at this time even though people thought we both thought the kings were maybe better than people were realizing it's crazy that we're having a you just said I think there's a, a world where they could be the number one seed. It, it the NBA changes fast, man. It's crazy. <laughs> it, it changes very fast. It's crazy that it took this long to change in Sacramento, but it, it's 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 changing really fast. Hundred percent, man. Well, I can't wait to watch more Kings basketball this off season. I've been trying to look at every single team in terms of how they produce last year. Their expectations coming in, so I really appreciate your perspective on the Kings, Deuce great podcast can you let the people know where they can find you yeah check us out man uh youtube.com uh slash at deuce and mo we're also on apple spotify we go live after every king's game but you know we're also increasing our nba content so if there's big stories or big news that happens we'll go live talk about it or we'll post clips too so just check out the youtube page we're always dropping content and you dude keep up the great work man I, i've been following you I think at least a year and just seeing yeah. your growth and just seeing the, the the amount of reps you're putting in and your love for it it's it goes a long way and it's cool in this world that we can have like legit basketball conversations it, it you know there's so many hot takes out there and that stuff can be fun and entertaining but I appreciate your your style I appreciate your work ethic and uh, yeah keep it up man thanks like I believe that there's a balance to everything and I just yeah. like basketball so so much like I really love talking about Sabonis's off ball screens and like how these guys like the the nuances of the game are things I'm always going to be here to talk for and this off season for me at least I, I said okay I'm going to just sit here and really get into the nitty gritty for each team so I can keep my basketball brain motivated and functioning compared to just saying you know what I'm going to chill for two or three months. So really appreciate Deuce. Go support that man. Links and all that will be in the description. But that'll be it for this week's episode of Gifted Hoops. We've been consistent for like four or five or six weeks now. So I'm happy. Appreciate all the support that you've been getting on the podcast. Again, Gifted Hoops podcast is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and also on the YouTube channel, which is also called Gifted Hoops. But appreciate you guys. Have a good one. We'll catch you next week for potentially a breakdown on the Philadelphia 76ers. Peace out, people. Have a good one. And a big shout out to Deuce for joining us on this episode. Peace.